Chapter 9 Part 1 Eight miles off the African coast, in the midst of a fiery, tropical sunset, Jack wrote to me for the first time. He expected to reach port by dusk. In case I was still feeling disappointed by his abrupt departure, he pointed out it was a good thing I hadn't gone back with him to this, to the Slovenia. From Brooklyn, it had only gone on into big gas tank barges off Perth Amboy. Ten days at sea, excuse me, ten days at sea, studying history, and Kierkegaard had opened new cracks quote, new cracks in his mind. He'd slept a lot, walked on deck in the sun, breathed in the fresh sea air, and, quote, now I'm my old self again, the healthy Jack you never saw. He spoke of Tangier as the city of ice, the blue pearl of Hesp Hesperides. He was raring to go. All through the voyage, he dined in silence with the only other passenger, a mysterious Yugoslavian Mata Hari. The Slovenia had almost foundered, had almost foundered five hundred miles out in a fearsome storm. In all these years as a seaman, he'd never seen such mountainous waves. The ship had gone plunging up and down in them like a rowboat. During this ordeal, but during this ordeal had come a moment of luminous calm when Jack had heard the words, Everything is God. Nothing ever happened except God. He had believed, and still did. I could believe too if I tried. Jack urged me to read Kierkegaard. Fear and Trembling was the right book, he thought not sickness unto death, which was too abstract in discussion of despair. Fear and trembling was about Abraham and Isaac, and had made him cry. There was a line he wrote right after that which said, quote, At moments I was sad remembering your tears. Quote, we'll meet again, he promised. The postscript was scribbled in Tangier, where Burroughs had immediately taken him to the Caspa to see the veiled women pass, and Jack had been so high he thought he'd seen it all before. You could smoke marijuana legally and publicly right in the cafes. He was very excited in this ancient wild town. He'd get himself a room of his own to write in. It was morning, and there was bright sunshine and the cries of Arab peddlers. Quote, tonight again, the mysterious caspa in that winging music. Right soon, he signed off. He wanted to hear the latest from New York. The blue air letter had gone off it had gone off on its journey to America without postage. Coming home from work, I'd found a notice of undelivered mail. I ran to the post office near early the next morning paid the twenty cents that was due, and standing there tore Jack's letter open and read it over several times. Until then, I somehow didn't, I somehow hadn't believed he would ever return to me. Quote, at moments I was sad, he'd written, quote, remembering your tears. It was a wonderful letter, tender and distant. I wrote back immediately, giving him the news he'd want he wanted, enclosing copies of the Village Voice article and another written in a similar spirit that had just appeared in the nation. I called Alan and told him I had heard from Jack. In my letter I said, quote, I miss you, think of you all the time. And I did. It was as if myself were strangely extended, walking around those bright streets on the other side of the world. But I told Jack I had nothing to say about the, his vision of God. I couldn't believe in God myself. In his next letter, he lectured me a little. Quote, when I said God in my vision in the sea, I didn't mean a bearded man in heaven. I meant that which passes through all. And added, quote, if you said it to the college crowd, 
um, excuse me, which if you set it to the college crowd would pass through one ear and out the other, as is proper and fitting. But I didn't believe in hit this Buddhist god either. My mind came up against a wall in these matters. The here and now was all I saw. I wanted to be happy in the here and now, and some day pull Jack into it with me if I could. My mailbox has on it the design of a perforated star. I can see through the small holes of white of commonplace envelopes. Oh, I can see through the small holes the white of commonplace envelopes, the mustard of telephone bills. Blue is the color of air letters. Opening the heavy front door at the end of each day, coming into the dusty hall, I look for that little glimpse of blue. Having played all the way from the subway, the game of will there be, won't there be blue this time. Sometimes my sureness, sometimes my sureness, there's a letter actually produces one. Other times my system fails me. There's a break in the invisible connection between Jack and me, and I lose him to the void he's always talking about. It's as if I have to be a juggler, suspending him in air through sheer concentration. I'm friendly with a man at work who always asks me about Jack. Quote, and what do you hear from Mr. Karak? It's ironic to call an outlaw, quote, Mr. He hates MCA as much as I do. It's irony that keeps us going. We joke on each other about the wood paneling and old English hunting prints in the elevators and the leather-bound seats of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and other classics in each reception room that are only binding minus books and the dress codes requiring women to wear nylons and high-necked dresses all summer and permitting men to wear sports jackets only on Fridays. At this respectability, he assures me, it's only a front. Quote, and what does your friend Jack say about Tangier? There's something avid, melancholy, about his interest. He's read all the articles, wants me to promise to arrange a meeting between himself and Jack when Jack comes back to the States. Every day he asks me to come into his office, and shuts the door and talks to me for hours about his disappointing life, staring at me interest, staring at me intensely as if maybe I've had, I have the key to everything and it's going to come to me any minute and I'll give it to him. He wears ugly, shiny brown suits and white shirts and has the sallow look of being unloved. Sometimes on his way home to his wife and kids, he says he'll drop me off in, in his cap. <clears throat> he tells the driver to wait, then kisses me good night at the, my door. I can taste the sallowness in his kisses. He'd been a war hero in the Pacific, then had his wild period, quite similar to Jack's, in the village before he got married, when he was writing his novel about the war that a famous critic reads part of excuse me, that a famous critic reads parts of in manuscript and praised. One day he says he's decided to tell me the very worst, most shameful thing about himself. He wants me to have no illusions about him. Turns out he's none other than the king of the true confession ri confessions writers. He does it on side every night after work. Under various pseudonyms, he writes those humiliating stories so effortlessly that, the greatest irony of all, he suspects they're natural to him. He's really come to think he can't do anything else. Quote, I can't possibly be tr that can't possibly be true, I say. But he looks at me so sadly, askingly, across his desk, the key, the key that I feel bewilderingly guilty, as if I'm meanly denying him some dust of Vescian absolute absolution, and I end up going out for drinks with him and then to bed for a quick half hour before he goes home to his wife. 
I have the strange feeling that if I ever told Jack about this lapse, he would somehow understand and not be troubled by it. By the end of March, Jack was sounding restless. He hadn't found what he'd expected. Quote, not too many vibrations in Tangier and the Arabs are and the Arabs very quiet. Send out no vibrations at all, he wrote. In a few days, Alan and Peter would be landing, and and he and Burroughs would row out to meet their ship. Rowing in the bay was one of their principal occupations. Jack was also typing a manuscript for Burroughs called, quote, Naked Oh, excuse me, called Naked Lunch. Most of the time he took long walks, thus avoiding the dull expatriate characters in the cafes. He'd watch the slow dance of the ancient fishermen pulling in their nets or muse alone in his hotel room. Everything was a little too slow, even the mail. He'd just gotten a letter from me that was four weeks old. Somehow in Tangier, he couldn't write, but that could wait. Quote, what I'm actually doing is thinking nostalgic thoughts of Frisco. He'd go off to Paris early in April. The others could join him later. He'd find a cheap garret, then on to Brittany, London, Dublin, after which he'd work his way back on a freighter. Probably he shouldn't have come at all. <clears throat> This old world scene didn't interest him. He had more important things to do in America, where it was likely to be seeing me in New York in July. He admitted he looked forward to that. None of the girls he'd met spoke English, and he was weary of whores. Quote, Most fags abound in this sinister international hive of queens. With Burroughs at his guide, excuse me, with Burroughs as his guide. He sampled all the vices of Tangier, smoked opium, eaten hashish. Now he was musing in the darkness of his room, where he knew he was better off. The moon, the sea, the liquid lights of ships at anchor in the bay were enough. They should have been, but weren't. He felt abashed, remembering the vigor of older American traveler writers like Twain and Muir, <clears throat> as though he'd never written a line himself. Bitterly, Jack compared his, quote, new-found, utter, listless, dispiritedness, and no care of where I am, what I do, to their enthusiasm. It turned out, though, that he and Burroughs had been poisoned by some hashish that had been sprayed with arsenic. Quote, so that explains my so far dispirited visit in Tangier and feeling of no vibrations. <laughs>